Now to 1978, and again, two more great novelties from that year. This series continuing the best opening ideas as we're getting nearer and nearer the computer age of chess. But everything found so far, and including this video, is found with the human mind. Remember to like and subscribe to the channel. It's blooming hot in England. I'm in a small office, so I might get a bit drippy today, but it's better than you here in the fan, I guess. So uh, the first encounter we're going to look at is between two legendary players. We have Believsky with the white pieces, who um, was, again, these guys are all around the area of the Soviet Union, Russian. Believsky uh, has been a very famous world leading player for a, a, a long period, a long, a long time. He's been up there trying to qualify for the, the highest titles in chess. And his opponent, another strong player, Yubilava, is now a very famous chess coach, coaching some of the uh, world's winning national teams. Both have got a history in chess, both understand the game incredibly well. Now, the game started with the Sicilian, and as we often see, the Sicilian leads to a lot of interesting opening ideas, and it's the same here. Now, after knight to f3, d6, um, d4, we have the open Sicilian, and I all, I recommend to anyone who, who like starting chess, you should all play the open Sicilian from black and white. Play, pick one line as black, the dragon and Nidorf, have a go at that, and always try playing d4 as white, because it's one opening where you learn to use your pieces very well with the white on the white side. You have to attack, you have to generate initiatives, and you have to force yourself to attack. Uh, I would suggest playing the most aggressive lines where you, as white you try to castle queenside, because this can only help your chess, and I, I recommend you will give it a go. You don't have to stick to it, but just learn some aggressive setups. And with black, it's a very good counter-attacking opening. Now we've seen a6 being played so far, the Nidorf, but knight c6 hasn't been seen in any previous videos. And this is the classical Sicilian. A Sicilian, which is obviously a very decent, a very decent move, developing, attacking the center. Now the main move is the move Believsky played, bishop g5. And this is the move we looked at mainly against the Nidorf. So again, if you're trying to learn how to play against the Sicilian, uh, I would say these videos, this series, is a very good starting point, giving you that historical walkthrough. And the general idea of moving the bishop here, as we've seen, is to pressurize black as much as possible, move the queen, castle queenside, and then use the f-pawn in a lot of cases. So bishop d7 is a bit of an older system. e6 is now considered more safer where black tries to get his king or give the king the option of castling and now queen d2 white continues the plan black plays rook c8 at the time this was considered to be a very good line for black um, because black gets very quick counterplay f4 and now knight takes d4 this is often a move played to black is claiming to win a tempo by forcing the queen there but also to allow the opening of the C file. And now white uses the center E5, and one of the things I really like about Believsky's play throughout his life has been he's a very aggressive full frontal player, meaning he doesn't hang around. Believsky loves attacking. He loves playing the sharpest lines. And that's, I think, how he becomes such a great player. I think all of the strong players have played I would say sharp chess at some point in their life to learn how to do that and if you feel like you're in a ruck uh, playing the same systems at home just sharpen up your game even if you get some bad openings bad results in the long run it can only help you to become a more aggressive player but this system until this game came along was thought to be quite good for, for black because after e6 if white takes the knight the queen can take the bishop and Black was considered to have good play with a dark square bishop being able to come to a number of squares and pressure against c3. White went into previously fought theory where now the standard exchange sacrifice rook takes c3 has been given uh, in, in previous publications before 1978. It's just been very good for black. Um, and the point of this sacrifice is, well, if pawn takes, black clearly has quite a lot of ideas with the knight coming in, the bishop coming in, the queen coming in. So this would be okay. If the queen captures there, 
Black can even simply exchange queens off with the knight diving into e4, attacking the bishop, attacking the pawn, attacking f2. And this is a very big initiative for black. Black's better here. Um, so what can white do? And bishop d2 being played only once before, this idea. But it looks so, so risky. As after queen takes a2, you're threatened with mate. You're getting attacked. In to play this way, you have to be brave and you have to be confident in your calculations. Very important. There's a big difference between weaker players and strong players. Strong players, they are very confident in calculating. You've got to be the same. If you're the kind of player who tries to avoid tactics because you're not so sure about your calculation skills, big error. Stop doing any opening work, work on your calculations. So important to be confident. Every chess player has to calculate at some point. Now, bishop takes c3 is played because the king has to give it square. And now g6 considered the move, the brilliant idea that refutes this. Remember, no computers around at the time. And the point being, let's say you take the knight, suddenly it's checkmate because after this check, you take away the d2 square for the king. So a move like bishop d2 is checkmate. The king cannot escape. And, you know, this g6, like I say, very nice move. I mean, uh, checking here only helps white. The king is actually quite safe there with threats against the, the, the queen and thing. And there was the previous game seen in this um, opening actually went queen f4. And it looks like white's doing okay. Because again, the king can run away. White's material up. White stopped the check. But after black's next move, white actually resigned uh, in, in the previously seen game. Can you find a move for black here? And do pause if need be. The move knight to e4 is an incredible move. Again, taking away the square and trying to take away the queen and its cover of h6. So queen takes e4, suddenly it's the same idea. Check and checkmate on a1. The knight on e4 threatens checkmate again. And this knight is just too strong. You have to go b3. I take your bishop, win a piece, win the game. So Believsky now came up with about a 10 move prearranged kind of thinking and he did this all on his own work this out he started with b4 the point being if bishop h6 check we can block the check and the queen now comes back very important move but to the human eye this looks very risky after knight d5 black is still attacking with everything so you have to be very relying so deeply on your calculation bishop c4 another brave move trying to use those bishops to attack and defend Bishop h6 check, obviously the logical move, and you have to give up your rook here with rook d2. But luckily, the pressure against the queen, the pressure against the knight, is what gives white the initiative. And he's covering all these checks. Queen a3 check, the, the bishop now retreats, and the queen has to take on b4. And even here, it kind of seems surely black is doing all right, but it's those who calculate that little deeper. Bishop takes d5. The queen has to be exchanged off. And in this case, you have to try and grab the rook. The exchanges continue. And it's only probably around here that black realized that this is not a safe position, even though it looks okay with the next move, white gains a great position and a winning position. E6, threatening the rook, winning the bishop. Yes, black has some pawns, but the bishop is much stronger and white went on to win a very nice game here. So definite shows you how, if you're playing sharp lines, calculation key. Now the next game was an even more famous example and this was from the 10th game of the 1978 uh, Chess World Championships between Karpov and Korchnoi. One, one of the most famous, if not the most famous world championships. Um, you had 72 Bobby Fischer versus Spassky. Uh, really brilliant world championships. I like the Kasparov Karpov world championships, but this one was great. You had the, um, should we say, the, the player which the Soviet Union really nurtured, they wanted to win, who, who abided by the law, really um, was their poster boy, Karpov. He did everything they wanted to do. And then you had the rebellious Korchnoi, who rebelled against uh, the, the Soviet Union a bit and often got himself in trouble. Karpov, therefore, had a much better team of seconds helping him out in the match, but 
Corduroy was such a big fighter, really tough life he had. He never gave up. He was determined, more determined than any, any other player. And that goes until this day. And this game just shows you how good preparation can 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 really... It, okay, this game ended in a draw, but how it can really give you an edge in, in any match. What Korchnoi said after the, this game was that the move that Karpov played on move 11 was a move that is only found once in 100 years. So Karpov with white starts with e4. And they go into the Spanish a6. We've seen this lots of times before. And after castles, this rule Lopez. Now the sort of open variation of Spanish black grabs the pawn on e4. These positions become more tactical than when black plays a slower maneuvering game because more lines open up. But, but both sides get more tactical opportunities. White plays d4, of course, a good idea. Just trying to open up the center of the board, open up lines, get to the king. b5, following theory. And now, the, after this move, black certainly should not be greedy here. There's many ideas with white using the d5 square. Black needs to take the center, and he does that. White regains the pawn. Black tries to consolidate his center with this move. Now this position is still, I would say, much trickier for black to play. It's at the moment it's thought to be a little bit better for white theoretically. But the, the dangers black has is that white's king is castled. White's pawn on e5 can be a very good pawn for starting an attack. Uh, it's well known that if you have a pawn on e5 as white in nearly any position in the middle game, you should really use it as a springboard to attack your opponent's king. It takes away the defensive f6 square for the knight when the king castles and it, it really cramps the position. But they follow normal theory, knight bd2. The knight now comes to c5, important for black to try and get rid of the bishop. This is one of the main trumps of black's opening to get the bishop pair. c3, and now the bishop tries to get back. d4, this is still theoretically important nowadays. And now comes the punch, a move that had never been played before knight g5 and this was certainly probably the most important novelty from 1978 from the whole world championships for a long time the knight moves to a square where it can seemingly be captured for nothing it's a phenomenal idea saved for this match it was later um thought that uh, on Karpov's team of seconds there was the great Mikhail Tao whose idea this could have been and Korchnoi was lacking this. Um, he obviously had seconds, but not as strong as Karpov. He was supported by the Soviet Union. They, they really wanted him mainly to, to win this match. And uh, this must have been a tremendous shock to Black. And it's still very much playable to, the day, to this day, this move. Now, Korchnoi decided upon a good decision, I feel. Taking this knight is playable, but you have to be... <sighs> very brave um, in the game he just took on c3 and this allows white to get rid of that bishop which should give him an edge and did now taking the knight is possible and here we see the idea behind this opening novelty the first time it's played in this match queen f3 and there's suddenly this problem with the knight in previous positions there was a knight on f3 and black had queen d7 but now all of a sudden this is this is really hard to stop and if you try to defend it with your king which may look all right there's even the move bishop d5 and again this is a very hard move to see which Korchnoi must have suddenly realized over the board but this move is very good if you take it my queen comes in your king is weak if you take on e5 now i can get rid of my bishop and take on a8 winning the exchange the way that black is now considered he can play this position leading to wild and wonderful positions is castling queenside crazy and after some exchange on e6 taking here queen takes e5 but you can understand why an unprepared player would not want to do this and you see this a lot a high level chess you don't want to walk in to your opponent's preparation often picking the second best move is correct now the game continues d takes c3 and now you see White's idea is to get rid of that strong piece there on e6. It was a good blockader of White's position. After this move, you can also see the Black King's a little bit weaker. 
Pawn takes here, but Korchnoi defends brilliantly. Queen d3. And this is a great active move. I don't think many other players would have been able to defend with such uh, br brilliancy as this. They would have folded. Active defense. Bravely just saying, right, I'm going to come for the pawn. And now Karpov played knight to f3. The queens came off. Karpov had an advantage with the two bishops, but Korchnoi showed his brilliant resistance and drew. It was only later on when Gary Kasparov had this position against Anand when Gary Kasparov used his team of seconds to come up with yet another brilliant novelty, which was bishop c2. And this is in the future. This hadn't been found at the time. And the point being after knight takes c3, knight b3 was Gary's idea, sacrificing the rook here to gain this attack over here. And you can look at this game as a very famous game of this, leading to a brilliant win. Uh, one point in these positions again is this queen coming to f3 so um, again just imagine this knight g5 playing it and I think what we can learn from this is if you ever get faced with a surprising move in the, in the opening uh, obviously trying to calculate it it might be rubbish and if you can accept the challenge do but also try to play the most active defense and this is you know apart from taking the knight at least Korchnoi activates his queen to d3 here. And he does do a brilliant job defending. But again, what a move, what a move without computers. Remember to like and subscribe to this channel. And now we come over to my facts for 1978. Boom! I've only got three for you today, so you can you can hang around. Keith Moon, the late drummer of The Who, died in 1978. Um, he overdosed, I think he was 33 or 32, he was an amazing drummer, but known for his partying, one of the hardiest, hardest partiers, rock and roll partiers out there, so he had a good life. American porn publisher Larry Flint is shot and paralysed, well at least he's got something to do in his chair, eh? was, or was he paralysed from the waist down? And the world population in 1978, only 42, 42 years ago, was estimated at 4.4 billion. What is the world's population today? 7.7 .7 billion, nearly double that. Amazing how quickly uh, sprogs are popping out. Thank you, like and subscribe to the channel and we'll continue going through these brilliant novelties and looking at the evolution of chess with this video series.